Man, can I, can I read a Bible verse? I'm going to read us a verse. It's Easter week. Easter week. So I, I thought I would read a little a, a Bible verse for us to get started as we go into worship. It's in Matthew chapter 28. It's, it's when they find the tomb empty. That's what Easter is about, right? You guys know the story? Yeah, you guys know the story. They go look for him. He's not here. He's risen. But here's what I, here's what I want to I want to hit us on. Starting at Matthew chapter 28, verse 8. This is what, this is what we see. It says, They departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and they ran to tell the disciples. And as they're going, here's the kicker. Jesus met them. So he had died, rose from the grave. He met them. He says, Greetings. And they came up took a hold of his feet and worshiped. The only proper response to the crucified, risen, and exalted king is abandonment and worship. Later in Matthew chapter 28, it says, they came to the mountain where Jesus directed them. And when they saw him, they fell down and worshiped him. The only response to King Jesus, crucified and raised from the dead, is a heart fully yielded, surrendered, abandoned in the place of worship. Can we lift our hands all across this room tonight? Jesus, we've come here to worship you, to pour our affection on the crucified and risen King. There's no other response. There's nothing else we can do except approach you with extreme gratitude in our hearts. Thanksgiving in our mouths. We lift up our voice tonight. We set our eyes on you. We tell you we love you. We're so grateful for what what was accomplished on that tree. That when we put our faith in you, when you died, we died. When you were raised, we were raised to newness of life. So, oh, glorious King Jesus, receive our worship tonight. Just all across the room, can you begin to tell Jesus how grateful you are? Just can you lift up your own sound, your own song, your own words of thanksgiving and gratitude as this week we're celebrating what happened at Calvary where our glorious our glorious king took on our sin the substitute for all of humanity we stand here forgiven and free because of what you've done King Jesus come on just begin to lift your voice we love you Jesus we worship you tonight fill this place with worship up thanks to the King of Kings. Come on, keep lifting up adoration. Oh, we thank you, Jesus.
here to worship.
exaltation I was born to lift the name above all names You hear the melody of all creation But there's a song of praise that only I can pray Who else is worthy? Who else is worthy? There is no one, only Jesus. Who else is worthy? Who else is worthy? There is no one, only Jesus. Who else? Who else is worthy?
Some of you haven't, it's called Marvelous. And Lindy and some friends wrote it and introduced it to us in the fall. And the chorus is so simple, it just says, there is no one like you, God. There is no one like you, no one. So as we learn this tonight and cry this out, can we just declare this straight to him, that as we remember the cross, remember what Jesus did for us, that there's no God like him. There's no one like Jesus. Oh, we love you, Jesus. Let's sing your marvelous. Your marvelous. Your wonderful counselor. Jesus, Almighty God. Prince of Peace. The King of Kings. Jesus, your wonderful, wonderful counselor. Jesus, Almighty God. The Prince of Peace. The King of Kings. There is no one like you, God. There is no one like you, no one. There is no one like you, God. Glory to the King of Heaven, who 
Praise your name, Father.
I know it was the blood Could have only been the blood Hallelujah Hallelujah I know it was the blood Cause it's never been about before of our King, who defeated death, defeated the grave, raised in victory, seated high, lifted up. We love you tonight, Jesus. We honor you. We bless your name tonight. We thank you that you are being worshiped in Orange County, in LA, in California, that the name of Jesus is being exalted. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Come on, can we give a shout to Jesus tonight? It's so good. Give someone a high five, a hug. Head back to your seats. We're going to jump into the message tonight. As you're going back to your seats, if this is your first time to a Monday night, raise your hand up high. We want to see you. Welcome. Can we give it up for our new friends tonight? We're so glad you're here. Thank you for coming, worshiping Jesus with us. We love Monday nights. It's the best night of the week. We got some announcements that we're going to go after, and then we're going to get into the word tonight. You guys excited? Feeling good? You guys happy? It's going to be an awesome week this week. There should be enough seats down here. If there's not, you can go out the back door upstairs. There's uh, some seats in the balcony up there, some friendly faces. You guys friendly in the balcony? Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. There's seats up there. Nick's friendly. There's a few seats around, you know. Come down. Come say hi. Um, I'm going to share a few announcements. We're going to jump in, just waiting for you to get to your seats. So I'm just kind of awkwardly stalling until you find your seats. 
I wish I had a joke, but they've all left my brain. All right, we're going to jump in. Here's the deal. Next week, everybody say next week. week. We're not going to be in this building next week. But we are still gathering. Say still gathering. gathering. We're still gathering. And we're going to gather in L.A. Is there a slide up? There it is. Next Monday night, April 1st, Tapestry, L.A., 6 o'clock. We're going to gather in Los Angeles, and we want you to come, make the drive. It's going to be amazing. We want to bring our faith from Orange County, take it to L.A. How many of you know God has, a, has an insane plan and destiny for Los Angeles? And how many of you know that God has touched the earth from what's happened in Los Angeles, and he wants to do it again? A couple of you heard, felt it. So... Yeah, that's right. God has a plan for Los Angeles. So we're going down next week. Monday night, we'll be in Los Angeles, 6 o'clock, Tapestry LA. We will not be here. Don't come to the crossing. Come to LA. It's going to be amazing. And so we're having something that's happening all week in Los Angeles. So we're doing Monday night in LA, and then we're going to have outreaches happening all throughout the week, every day of the week. Yeah, you can cheer. It's amazing. The gospel is going to go forward. Do you guys know what happens when the gospel gets preached? People get saved. Do you know what else happens when the gospel gets preached? People get healed. Do you know, do you know what else happens when the gospel is preached? The kingdom comes. That's right. Cities get changed by the gospel. And the gospel, the beautiful thing about it is you preach the gospel. So we need preachers. Those who are burning with Jesus in their heart, that's all of you. So here's the deal. We want you to come be a part of We know you have jobs, different things happening throughout the week. So you can come be a part of any day you want. I think we got a slide for it. Can we get the slide for uh, how to register? So here's the deal. This specific, okay, this specific one is for at the end of the week. So we're going to do outreach all week, all throughout L.A. We're going to have trainings in the mornings, outreaches in the afternoons. And then we're, it's going to culminate on Friday, say Friday. April 5th, back at Tapestry, 6.30, we're going to have a blowout night of worship, going after the presence together again. So here's the deal. That's a QR code. You can scan it. You can register for it. So can you do me a favor? If if you're even thinking about coming, smallest chance, scan the code, register. It'll give you all the details. We want to bring our faith down to uh, Los Angeles, up to Los Angeles. Uh, to partner with what the Lord's already doing there. So come be a part of it, come hang out with us. Can I get the next slide? Oh, is this Riders? Is this CR Youth? Man, oh man. Here's the deal. We've got some incredible things happening this summer. One of them is, is Circuit Riders Youth. This is happening in Dallas, Texas and Kona, Hawaii. So if you're in high school, I want to highly encourage you, come be a part of it. If you know a high schooler, send them the link. Send them a screenshot. Tell them to go. 525 early bird price. That ends April 1st. That's on Monday, next week. So sign up. Come be a part of it. It's going to be insane. Change your life. Next slide. See our schools. Man, if you've ever wanted to... You know those nights, those Monday, those Monday nights where it's like, I don't want it to end. We have to like, we got to stop worshiping. We don't really want to stop. Do you know, what I, you know that feeling? Every time. every time, Nick. It's true. I feel it every time. So here's the deal. We have these schools called CR schools where we don't have to always stop. We can keep going. And it lasts for like a week. We get to come together, go deep in the presence, worship, teaching, training, activation. It's amazing. So we're having three schools. One is going to be here in Orange County. Another one is going to be in Paris, France. Man, that one sounds fun. And then Finland. We're going to Finland. So you can come. You can be a part of it. Sign up. Is there any other slides? Brave love. I knew it was coming. I knew it was coming. If you haven't signed up yet for the Brave Love Gathering, sign up. Go. Be there. It's going to change your life. I promise you. I promise you. It's going to change your life. So it's happening. The Global Conference, Angeles Temple, Los Angeles, June 21st, 22nd. It's going to be amazing. Amen. You did it. We got through the announcements. Uh, Okay. 
Everybody lean in. Everybody lean in. All right, you guys ready for the message? Can we welcome Nick Brent up tonight? Thank you, bro. How's everybody doing tonight? We doing good? Okay, I got a little worried because uh, we're going to L.A. next week, and I kind of just felt, I just saw in my mind's eye one of you just pulling up here. And, like, faithfully waiting outside for us to open the doors. Like, just, wow, it must be more of a quiet worship set tonight. And then for you, you're going to go check the Instagram, and we're not here. So where are we having Monday nights next week? <laughs> what city is it in? What direction is that? Can we all point that direction? I don't know either. That's all right. Google Maps. That's what we need it for. Well, guys, I'm so excited tonight. We're in this series in the book of Acts. We're talking about the Holy Spirit moving. And tonight we come to an epic passage in X-19. And what we're about to experience and see what's about to take place is what revival looks like in the center of a cultural center. What does revival look like in a change-making city? How many of you know that we live in a change-making part of the country? I know that we're all supposed to be equal. We all are equal in terms of, you know, God loves us all. But how many know that all states are not created equal? Whoa, whoa, don't agree. Just kind of agree in your mind. Again, I can say this because I'm humble. I repented. I didn't, I'm not from California, but I have to admit, even though I'm proud of my home state, well, I'm not that proud, but I am proud of my home state, there is something powerful that I cannot argue about Southern California. I don't know of very many states that are changing and influencing people all around the world. There are people in other countries that know our movies and don't know the gospel. That is how powerful Southern California is. I've had friends go places that have no clean water, but you know what they do have? Coca-Cola. Right, there is an undeniable influence in Los Angeles, in Orange County, in San Diego County. There's something about this region that even God has used in the past, unleashing all kinds of movements, the Azusa Street Revival, which really birthed the charismatic church, you have Amy Simple McPherson, who was feeding more people in Los Angeles during the Great Depression than the government. That is wild. You have movement after movement after movement birthed from the very ground that we live in. But what does change look like in a place like this? Because I don't know if, if you're like me. When I step into like Los Angeles, I like to visit Los Angeles. I don't like to live there. Uh, anyone else that way? Like you like to go in for the photo op and then leave. Like that's, that's your relationship with LA. I know exactly where I'm gonna go. I go to Venice. I go to that one area, Abbot Kinney right there. I get my coffee. I get a little ice cream. I walk around in a small radius, a safe radius, and then I leave. <laughs> Any, anyone else have this experience? I just insulted like six people from LA. I'm sorry. I do love it. I'm just jealous. And... Uh, but there's something about when I walk into Los Angeles, I get overwhelmed. Like when I remember the first time I drove into Huntington Beach, I was in college and I drove down Beach Boulevard. Beach Boulevard was bigger than my entire town I was from. And this is like a side quest town. This is not even a main town. I'm driving to places and it's mall after mall after mall. Like where I'm from, like the mall was like a big deal. You drove to the mall, like that was an event. We went to the mall, like a Macy's, a Nordstrom's, Zoomies was there, right? Like, this is epic. And what I want to present to you tonight is I think that we are more shaped by modern, because the gospel has a recipe for change, but a lot of times its recipe is not our recipe. And the reason why this is relevant is I think that Gen Z or our generation, millennials and Gen Z in your 20s, your teens, that we are essentially an activist generation. I think because, not that maybe other cultures and times didn't want to be, but I think with the advent of the internet, more than ever before, all of us can throw our two cents in about culture. How many of you have an ex formerly known as Twitter account? <laughs> okay, that already tells me everything I need to know. No, I'm just kidding. But the point, 
is when you get on there, it is everybody has something to say about everything. I get anxiety sometimes just reading the ads at each other and they escalate. Like it starts with like, I believe in this cause. And the next person goes, I disagree. And the person goes, you're stupid for believing that. And then the next person's like, you are a total idiot. No one loves you. And somehow we get from, we disagree to you are horrible, to you are my enemy. And this is really what a lot of activism has become. But I think at the heart of our generation, we desire to see a changed world. This is what stats tell us about our generation. 62% of us are passionate about changing the world for the better, but only 56% of us believe we can. Doesn't that kind of feel like the generation half is like, we can change the world, and the other half is like, I need a sandwich. Like, it's just, I... Like, I just want Froyo tonight. I just want something else. Like, I don't know that we can change anything. 36% of Gen Z participated in a political rally or protest or signed a petition for a cause they agree with. Isn't that incredible? One third of our entire generation has been active in some kind of campaign or protest. Activating for, uh, uh, um, activating, I don't know why, <laughs> campaigning. Yeah, they did activate, campaigning for cultural change. Now, when you ask Gen Z, what do they think about the future? Is it going to be better, worse, or the same? This is how they responded. 32% of us, about a third, say that the future is going to be worse for future generations. 25% of us believe it's probably going to be about the same. And 43% believe that it's going to be better. Here are some of the causes that... Um, in no particular order that, that studies have shown are like the top causes amongst our generation. Number one, mental health. Number two, racism. Number three, gun violence. Number four, drug abuse and addiction. Five, climate change. Six, immigration policy. Seven, economic inequality. Um, eight, federal budget deficit. Nine, gender inequality. And then ten, threats to voting rights. And the thing that when you study Gen Z is they're unlike other generations where they are satisfied as long as things are changing, they're happy. It doesn't matter what pace it is. Our generation is a little bit different. Because we've had technology and everything in our life has changed literally from year to year so quickly. Isn't it amazing, right? You can build a whole following on a platform and the day it's gone. And you're irrelevant and you have to move to the next thing. We're so used to sudden and radical changes in society that we don't want anything less than immediate change right now. And you see this attitude expressed. How many remember during Black Lives Matter, that phrase, defund the police, began to circle around America? Now that's a very interesting idea if you think about it. That the answer to... Getting rid of violence is getting rid of the only people who are protecting us from violence outside of vigilantes. I don't know if we thought through it fully. How many of you are happy that a policeman is down the road? And I'm all for we need to reform and strengthen and train and educate, but probably doing away with all of it is probably not the right call. <laughs> Someone's like, yes, okay. <laughs> it's awesome. It's not, <laughs> okay, we're going to keep going. My point is this, is that statement was a statement out of the personality of our generation. If we don't see the change we want, let's burn it down. That's why everyone liked Bernie Sanders. That's why everyone liked Donald Trump. They wanted to find these figures who would come in and burn everything down. And you got all these people in the center, because we all like to think that we're in the center, like we're moderate, like we're logical and, you know, balanced, like we really see all points of sides. But in our heart of hearts, we're like, tear down the system! <laughs> right? If you looked at our inner attitude, we got a little bit of nirvana going on, like we can't trust the institution we need a new institution. But how many of you know that even though that's a great desire to see radical change quickly and now, and I do too, want to see justice here and now, I do too, that the way though our generation and the way that the world has gone about it is flawed. Because if it was working, we'd have a changed world. How many of you notice that like the more we try to change it, the more it keeps becoming unchanged? 
Because it seems like the harder we keep pushing for change, the more divided and tribal the change is becoming. And why is it that the harder we're changing, the more hopeless it seems that anything is going to change at all? It's because there's a way the scripture said it seems right to a man. But in the end... And so I think that even in this room tonight, there's probably two camps of us. I think some of you, you are an activist at heart. And I love that. That's what I am. Like, I got an opinion about everything. Who has an opinion about everything? Let's just do an honest poll right now. Go ahead and come clean. You got an opinion about everything. You just learned about AI. But, uh, I, dude. <laughs> like, after I share a new fact, you're already coming up with an opinion about that fact. That's how fast your brain works. Right? And then there are some of us, that's like the activist heart. You know, I feel like the activist heart is the type of person that like tells their close friends that they're angry at them through posting a story on your close friends on Instagram. <laughs> Do you know people like this? Yeah. My life is so hard. If normally people love me, close friends. And you're like. <laughs> Only our generation would do that. Only our generation goes, I know what a great tactic is. Let me just reach out to all my closest friends in a really passive aggressive way so that they, anyway, that was for free. Don't do that anymore. All right. Okay. Phone calls, coffee, sharing your feelings. Brene Brown can help you. All right. So here, then we have the other side. It's the apathetic. It's the overwhelmed. It's it, Nick. I don't even know where I'm going. I, I can't figure out where society is going. Nick, I love that talk on revival. Amen, dude, but, like, I need revival in my finances tomorrow. <laughs> like, Nick, I so get you, dude, the missional heart, that missions week. That seems like something epic to be a part of, but, dude, everything in my life is burning down. Actually, I'm just here to get prayer at the end of the service, hoping that God will bail me out. See, I think, like, in a relational context, like, the apathetic are like, that friend you have on Find My Friends, and you can see them in their apartment. <laughs> and it's 7 p.m., you know they're not sleeping. And you text them, and it's left on red. <laughs> You're like, bro, come out. Let's go do something fun. The night is young. Red. <laughs> Half our generation is stuck in this activism going, we want to see a better world, but I think we're going about it the wrong way. And the other half is standing over here going, I'm just trying, Nick, to get the confidence to live my own life. I can't really worry about where society's going. But the problem is, is that both attitudes are not rooted in the gospel. Because if you correctly understood the gospel, you'd understand how change actually comes. Apathy is related to hopelessness. When you are without hope is when you become apathetic. When you no longer believe that change is possible, you stop caring. It's very difficult to not care if you have hope. And I think a lot of us are acting like we don't care, but it's simply because we just don't have any hope that we really could be part of the change. But see, we believe this, but it's a lie. It's because culture says that if you want to change things, you need to be powerful, you need to be influential, you need to have a position, and when you have that position, then you can see change, but the gospel is the opposite. It's an upside-down kingdom. Can we look at some verses for a moment? Acts 4, 13. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Zechariah 4, 6. Then he said, this is what the Lord says, Rubel, it is not by force nor by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord of heaven's army. The world says if you are powerful and have influence, you can change culture. But the gospel says be weak so you can be powerful. Be influential with me and then you will influence culture. See, if you want to be used, you don't need to be famous. In fact, it will be more difficult for you to be used if you're famous. Because God isn't looking for people with influence. He's looking for people who can be influenced. 
that's the essence of the Holy Spirit in our life is are you got it all together and you're just influencing the world or are you broken before God saying, Holy Spirit, influence me, I'll go wherever you have me. And when you're influenceable is when then you actually qualify to become a change agent in the kingdom of God. Now what's interesting is when they're looking at Peter and John, they're going, these are uneducated men. These are ordinary men. But they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. See, sometimes we have this quasi view that Jesus can change America, but we kind of don't, but like he can kind of change America, but we also need something else. But the truth is, is that Jesus is what America needs, all of it. Not just part of it, not just a gospel response at the altar. They need all of his life, all of his values, all of his beliefs. And if we all would fully follow Jesus, we would be walking in the America that God intended for us to have. See, if you want to have influence, you don't need followers. You need to look like him. We have plenty of influencers. We have plenty of business magnates. We have plenty of politicians. We have plenty of orators and people who can speak perfectly, but it seems like we don't have enough people where the common public goes, you were with Jesus. What? There's something with you. you were, yeah, you're a Christian, but it's, it's different. It's different. You were with Jesus. See, when you start realizing, oh, my word, the entry to being used by God to change society is personal brokenness saying, Jesus influenced me. And number two, that you can be ordinary and uneducated, but that what matters is not your leadership skills, but your love for Jesus and the embodiment of his values. All of a sudden, that apathy begins to wear off. Because you thought that you had to speak as good as your senior pastor. You thought you needed a stage. You thought you needed a microphone. But really what you need is to look like Jesus. Because it's not by power. It's not by pressure, says the Lord, but by my spirit. See, on the other side is the activist. And I think what's interesting about the activist is that we get it fundamentally wrong. We think that if we can change people's views and change people's behavior, that we can have a changed world. But that's the kingdom of man. Because how many of you know that if I pressure you to do the right thing and to think the right thing, that eventually you'll pop back and be yourself? Like how many of you have ever met someone? I don't know why. I've, how many of you have ever met a paranoid weed smoker? Maybe just me. I don't know where I'm hanging out. And uh, I don't know who I'm talking to. And I've talked to so many addicts who are so afraid of hell. They're so afraid of hell. They're so afraid of demons. They're so afraid of the judgment of God. But why is that fear, why is that guilt, why is that shame not enough to change them? It's because guilt and shaming you will get you to act in such a way for a season. But it is not a strong motivator to actually change you. And so what we have in society is you got the hyper-religious shaming and guilting everybody to Jesus, and you got the hyper-political shaming and guilting everyone to their belief, and they're wondering why nobody is getting changed, and they're only temporarily changing for a moment when they're around you. It's because gospel transformation happens from the inside out. Because this is the problem. It's not just our views and our behavior that's ruining the world. I wish sin was just that shallow. I wish sin was just when I got mad and yelled at someone and I was rude. But how many know sin is much worse than that? How many know sin doesn't just lead you to having false beliefs? It's much worse than that. Sin is something much deeper. See, the problem with the world is humanity. And if we want a new world, we need a new humanity. But how can we ever become a new humanity unless we get a new life? But we can't access new life because our sin has separated us from life. And so we need somebody 
to come in and to pay the price for our sin so that they can reconnect us back to life so that we can be born again and become a new creation. It's called the gospel. And we're expecting a world to be Christian when they're not a Christian. And we're expecting the world to change when they can't change. They're a slave to sin. And you can get them to temporarily change when they're around you or when culture pressures you enough. But sooner or later, it's going to come back to bite. Because unless you change the inside of a man or woman, you haven't changed them. This is what Martin Luther King fundamentally understood in the midst of all other activists. Other activists said you can use hate and pressure to change. And Martin Luther King said, no, you can't. Unless I change the inside of a man. Unless I change the essence of who they are. Through the power of redemptive love, they cannot be changed. See, we live in a world that wants to change things from the outside in. We want to live in a world where we change things in a way that makes sense, but it's an upside-down kingdom. And if you want to actually change the world, you have to go to the way of Jesus. Can we look at Acts 19 for a moment? We're going to look at a case study of how this cultural change plays out. Acts 19. We're going to look at the whole chapter. We're going Bible study mode. Who's down for Bible study mode? So let me give some context to what's going on. Ephesus. What kind of town is Ephesus? All right, Ephesus was the third largest city in the Roman Empire. It was a cultural center known for worshiping Artemis, the Roman god of fertility, magic, and astrology. It was known for witchcraft, in fact, a slang term in the Roman Empire. When someone says, you have Ephesian documents, it means that they contained witchcraft. So this city was so well known for a crazy fertility god. They were known for astrology and fortune telling, and they were known for witchcraft. I don't know about your city. I don't know where you're from, but I don't know if there's anywhere in America today that has a giant temple worshiping a fertility deity and that is so famous that all they are known for is witchcraft and astrology. Do we think that this place is probably maybe not the place that we would think to go for revival? I mean, it would be for me. But here comes Paul, and he's going to spend two and a half years there and we're going to see revival. Let's look at what happens, starting in verse 1. While Paul's in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions and came to Ephesus. He found some disciples and asked them, did you, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? No, they told him, we haven't heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Into what then were you baptized, he asked them. Into John's baptism, they replied. And Paul said, John baptized with a baptism of repentance on the people that they should believe in the one who would come after him, that it is in Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they began to speak in tongues and to prophesy. Now there were about 12 men in all. See, what's happening is, back then, how many know that before Jesus is on the scene, the gospel is known, John the Baptist was a prophet making way for Jesus, preaching a message of repentance. Change, 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 because the Messiah is coming and have a baptism in water as a sign that you are repenting from your old life of sin and are ready for the Messiah that's to come. This is the only message that they've heard. And the first thing the Holy Spirit does through Paul is he leads them to 12 men who only had part of the message, but they needed all the message. And Paul shares the message of Jesus. He shares the gospel. They give their life to him and instantly are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. See, we think that we change the world through the many. But if you want to change a city, you need to look for the few. It would be hard pressed for you to come up with any movement that the epicenter of that movement were a few dedicated men and women who were completely sold out to that cause. I don't know of any movement that's gone on to change anything that started with the masses. It always started with the few. And this is the pattern of the gospel. You come into a city and you look for your team. 
And this is exactly what's happening in the life of Paul. He's coming into the city saying, we're going to see transformation. We're going to see the gospel go for, forth. But first, we need a team. And I feel like this flies right in the face of our generational narrative. We like to go it alone or we like to go it with everybody. But we need to go with it with a small, dedicated team. Can I tell you, you cannot change Los Angeles by yourself. I don't care who you are. You gotta, I don't care how many followers you have on social media. It's not the way of Jesus. The way of Jesus is a small, dedicated team. And if you're waiting for everybody to come, you're waiting for the end of the movement. You're waiting for everyone to get there and actually all the revival to take place. But if you want to get in on the beginning of a revival, don't have pride and be looking around like, oh, God's not doing anything here. No, sometimes, no, he's about to do something and he's starting the process. But first, it looks like a small, dedicated team. See, I learned this throughout my journey of doing, doing all these kind of gospel campaigns on university campuses. I was always looking for the many. And I was always looking for the one, but it was usually a small group of very common people that they didn't have a resume, but they were fiery and all in. And I didn't recognize that God was about to birth the movement to save that campus through them. I was looking for who's the strong catalyst, who's the influential speaker, who's got the charisma, or I was looking for where are the masses, where are all the young adults gathering. But so much of the time, God is waiting for you in a living room full of men and women who are burning for Jesus. Do not despise the day of small beginnings. I wonder how many of us, we don't have a revival because we despise the way that God has decided to bring about revival. You want a full gathering, you want to go straight for the arena, you want to see the whole beach saved, you want to see your whole dorm saved, but you're not willing, you're not willing to get two, three, four, five, six of your friends in a room and go all in for Jesus and yield to his spirit and go, Jesus, I don't have a plan unless you give me one. Man, don't you love ideation? I love whiteboards. Design think. Los Angeles is a cultural place. They're artists. So maybe if we do an artist night, we'll get a dope venue, something we can't afford and never can afford, but we're going to get that on the board. And then we're going to invite a speaker that's never going to respond to our DM. And then we're going to get a worship leader that never is going to come. And you know what? That's how God's going to change the city. When does that ever happen? See, because you're going to need a team for what you're about to walk through if you're walking for change. Because we think it's just like change is like obedience to Jesus, straight to revival. This is what the journey to revival looks like. We got a team. It's fun for like a week. Because then you realize your team members have egos. I don't know. I'm not sure if I like this team. Let's go for it. Fail. Let's go for it again. Fail. Two people leave the team. God was testing you. Why are you in this? Is it for love or for you? Because I can't give revival if it's not about love. Three of you are left. Desperate of soul. Pain of your friends leaving you. Small breakthrough. God's testing you a little bit more. What's happening? Oh, motive's good. Not getting too high on the horse. Not posting to Instagram right away. Major revival tonight. Kneecap healed. <laughs> Healer unlocked. Like that's. <laughs> Never mind. I need to be careful. <laughs> yes, he wants Jesus following. Comment right now. No shrooms, only Jesus. just got healed of something. Something just came off of me. <laughs> See, because we like this story about revival, but then we get real discouraged that it's two and a half years away. Because that's the timeline for him. Is this like two and a half years of tons of faithfulness. Dude, how many of you panic if it, after you have to give a one-year commitment? Like a lease gives you anxiety. So it's like a 12-month lease? Yeah. Could you do 
one month? <laughs> can, you, can we just do like an Airbnb arrangement? I, you know, it's like, there's something in our generation that you're going to need a team and then you're going to need long-term commitment because God wants to know, if, are you really in it for the people or are you in it to become somebody? So crazy how many ministers are not in it for revival. They're in it so they can be known that they brought revival. So many people praying for healing are there because they want to be known that they prayed for healing. So many people want to be known for their power, sticking the camera in the faces of people who are in the worst moment of their life getting delivered because they need to know that they are the man with power. Where are the Jesus followers that says, hey, don't tell anybody? Don't tell anybody about this. Hey, keep this between me and you. I did this for you. Let's follow up soon. You know, like, like, like where, where is that? See, when God is going to send you into cultural change, he's going to send you with a team and into a team. I wonder if you have a team around you, but you're resisting that team. I wonder if you have a team, but you haven't recognized that team. What if God is bringing your Space Jam moment around you? Your team is right there, but you got to wake up to realize that God's breathing on you and saying, you're meant to change where you live, but where's your team? So then, next, Paul, he's got his team. Now let's see what he does. Verse 8, Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly over a period of three months, arguing and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when they became hardened and would not believe, slandering the way in front of the crowd, he withdrew from them, taking the disciples and conducting discussions every day in the lecture of Hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the residents of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. Whoa, what just happened? Sounds like Paul went to the religious, and guess what happens when you try to change a religious spirit? Anyone want to guess? Nothing. Nothing happens. They get angry. Because at the center of the spirit of religion is they would rather, rather be right than know the truth. They'd rather their argument be right than actually come into the freeing knowledge of the truth. That's why they're dogmatic. That's why they're not open-minded. That's why it's this way or the highway. And it's so funny. Sometimes it's the religious that should be the most likely to come to the excitement and the freeing power of Jesus and be the missionary force that God is wanting to unleash on the city. But how many of us are stuck talking to the religious you are still arguing with your friend. You're still telling them, no, God moves today. God can save the city. And they're angrier and angrier and angrier about the move of the Spirit. They're angrier and angrier and angrier about Jesus reaching young people. They're angrier and angrier and angrier about being a missional place. Well, see, Paul goes, you know what? I'm going to let your rejection be the Holy Spirit's leading. and I'm going to go somewhere else. And where he goes is a secular venue in the center of a city. And he rented it in a time that it was cheap, or maybe the guy gave it to him because it was in the heat of the day. See, I wonder how many of you, you're frustrated because you can't get on a religious platform. And you feel like you're getting rejected and God's against you and he's not with you. But God's actually in that saying, we got enough people in there, but we don't have someone as the center of the city in a neutral place. See, because we got to ask ourselves, are we missional? Like, this is kind of a very church building. It says the crossing on it. It says Bible verses on it. It looks like a church. It's nice like a church. It's got a parking garage like a Southern California church. But how many of you know there are so many people in Orange County and Los Angeles who will not step foot in this building? They won't. No matter what I do, they will not come out. But if I go to that room, if I go to that living room, if I go to that club, if I go to that studio, it's a neutral place where I can preach the same message I'm preaching on this stage, but I can preach it in a place that they'll receive it. You get your team. You pursue who you think is ready, but you let the rejection turn you and drive you to the center of a city 
to a neutral place. Man, America is desperate for some neutral places right now. Gen Z is desperate for some neutral places. See, there's not a lot of fanfare if you're a preacher who's famous for leading people to Christ by your barbecue. But there is a lot in for you if you can grow a service from a stage. See, I think right now, myself included, America, we're going through a heart check. Do we believe what we say we believe? Is our heart more for the lost than who cares where my reputation ends up in it? Or is our heart for the lost because that's part of the brand? And we're for the lost who are willing to come here. See, Paul's heart was not just for some. Paul's heart was for all. And so Paul was willing to go where no one else was willing to go to bring the message to as many people that could possibly hear it. And guess what happened? It says that so many per people heard the gospel that all of Asia, that whole region, heard the message of Jesus. I wonder how far the message would go of what we carry here on a Monday night if we decided to give it not here at a Monday night. Like, sure, we'll gather, we'll encourage, we'll grow, we'll do all the stuff, but what happens if we're primarily known for being out there versus being in here? Our Carry to Love teams, they just got back from the road. If you're a Carry to Love team, wave real quick so we can say hi to you. We love you, we love you. I told everyone to rest. Some of them are here, some of them are not. The diehards are here tonight. I see Shane Davis back there. Eastern Europe for Jesus. I see so many people. Welcome back. Oh my gosh. But do you know how many people they gathered? A little bit more than Monday night. Tonight, we've gathered about maybe 1,000 of us, 800 of us in this room. But over the last eight weeks, in neutral places, they've gathered 40,000 young people. And they've seen more than 4,000 of them give their life to Jesus. The neutral place. Can I tell you, though, the neutral place is probably going to be nameless and faceless. Because who were those 12 men again? What was their names? I'm trying to look here. Oh, it says, now they were about 12 men in all. It looks like their names weren't in there. There's not much in it for you if you want to change the city. Chances are you're going, to ch you're going to do all the work and some other young guy is going to step up, be a better preacher than you. In the end, everyone's going to be like, that guy's the guy. Can I tell you how many people I've met this sort of movements, but they were in the background? And you knew them for the speaker who came in and the worship band that was playing, but you never knew who really, you didn't know the guy It started in his living room, reaching his neighborhood, knocking on doors. See, I feel like God is calling each of us, where is your neutral place? Where is your stage? Where is your place of invitation? Is it your living room? Is it your barbecue? Is it the beach? Do you have access to some cool room, some cool place? Maybe God is calling you to take what you're experiencing on Monday night and not inviting me to come, not inviting Zach to come, Chase to come, Derek to come, but God's inviting you to bring your message into a neutral place, the message of the gospel so a generation can know it. Now things are about to heat up. Everyone say heat up. Look at this title of this section in my Bible. Demonism defeated at Ephesus. How many of you are intrigued? Because we gotta, who are these people who are getting saved? Now Paul is zooming in, Luke is zooming into what some of the crazy things that are happening. Are you ready for your mind to be blown? Verse 11, God was performing extraordinary miracles by Paul's hands so that even face cloths and aprons that had touched his skin were brought to the sick and the diseases left them. And evil spirits came out of them. How many of you know you don't need a marketing campaign if you can grab merch and just touch someone with it? <laughs> Crazy things are happening. It gets even crazier. They tell a story all of a sudden. Now some of these itinerant Jewish exorcists also attempted to pronounce the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I command you by the, by the Jesus that Paul preaches. They were called the seven sons of Sceva. Jewish, they were sons of a Jewish high priest were doing this. But here's how the evil spirit answered him, talked through the person. How many have seen 
a movie where a demon talks through somebody. How many of you, you're like, I've never seen a movie like that, Nick. <laughs> Veggie Tales, The Passion of the Christ, The Chosen. That's it. Pure flicks, that's all I do. Cooking shows, Food Network exclusively. TVY. I'm, st I'm still watching Arthur. I'm still watching it, bro. Still on that Blue's Clues life. It's amazing, man. How many of you have seen a demon actually talk through somebody? How many of a demon is, never mind. Talk through, never mind, never mind. So here comes the demon that's speaking through the person and says this, I know Jesus and I recognize Paul, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them, overpowered them all, and prevailed against them, so they ran out of the house naked and wounded. When this became known to everyone who lived in Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, they became afraid. And the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high esteem. And many who had become believers came confessing and disclosing their practices, while many of those who had practiced magic collected their books and burned them in front of everyone. So they calculated their value and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. In this way, the word of the Lord spread and prevailed. Do you know how much money that would be equivalent today of witchcraft books were burned in Ephesus? Five million dollars. So if each book was like 20 bucks, that's like 250,000 books of witchcraft were burned. And there's something in it, it's like, finally, those Satanists, they got right with Jesus. There's something, I don't know what that is in Christianity, those Satanists. <laughs> like, I'm with you, like, I'm, like, Satan, that's more me. I'm like, Satanists, come over, come out of that area. But here's the thing about these people is that they were all pre-Jesus. I wonder how many people we're angry at in culture are pre-Jesus. They don't even know Jesus. They don't even know there's a better option for them. Because the Jesus that they experienced was not dead religion. See, I think a lot of people have encountered a dead religion, Jesus. Get your life better, Jesus. They come into a service, and I just want to be honest that just because I have to be honest for myself, I'd come into service and you just see all these people that look like they don't want to be there. Whisper singing. <laughs> wake within me, wake within me. <laughs> and the most exciting moment of the service was someone got a quarter raise in. And then someone looks and they're like, just, just, they just try to put their hand down. When the last night you were in a club and everybody was excited to be there. And everybody is jumping around. All night, all night. Like just singing the dumbest songs. Like it's just... Because uh, dancing is awkward, isn't it, after a while? It's fun for like 10 minutes. And then like 10 minutes in, you're like, what am I doing? <laughs> See, I think that unbelievers have experienced a form of Christianity that lacks the passion and zeal that the world has for their sin. And they go, Joe Rogan seems to be more bold about how epic shrooms are Then my friend who's like beating around the bush about how he's a Christian. So do you follow Jesus? Well, you know, I, um, you know, um, I'm second, bro. I'm second. You know, it's like, what are you saying? <laughs> he, he greater than I, bro. What? <laughs> Where if you're encountering Paul, you're encountering a passion, a zeal, a power. And he's declaring Christ is crucified and your demons are tormenting you. See, because in paganism, in that witchcraft, how it worked is most people were afraid of evil spirits. And so what you would try to do is you try to find 
and get witchcraft books to control bigger evil spirits to get rid of other evil spirits. It's like a really crazy demonic game of trying to find allies in the spirit world that will protect you from other demonic spirits. See, all these people in this paganistic society, they're seeing that, oh my word, every evil spirit bows to the name of Jesus Christ. I don't want witchcraft. I've been trying to get free of these evil spirits. I've been trying to find peace. I've been trying to find salvation. How do I get out of here? And there's Paul saying, hey, there's a better way than your witchcraft. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. No wonder they got their witchcraft books and threw them in. How many people are waiting to throw their drugs in a giant burn pile? How many people are waiting to throw their pornography in a giant burn pile? How many people are waiting to throw their bad relationships and the way they're living and their anger and their rage and their unforgiveness in a giant burn pile? But first, somebody has to stand, not with condemning, you idiot, why are you this way? But say, no, there is a better way. I get so distraught over the narrative that everything has become political in Christianity. We're so mad that you're choosing this alternative lifestyle. But I never thought to ask, do you even know Jesus? Do you even know him? Have you even experienced him? And I wonder how many young people are sitting in the room going, why is this Christian so mad at me? What even is Luke? What even is Matthew? Who is Jesus? I just thought it was a boring church service. I didn't know he was alive. I didn't know he had a solution. I didn't know he had a purpose for me. Dude, here's my drugs, man. I've just been escaping from my pain. You're telling me I can be healed? You're telling me I don't have to hate myself anymore? Yes, that's what I'm telling you. You're telling me that the humanity that I'm experiencing is not God's intention, but he has something greater more than I can imagine. Yes, that's what I'm telling you. See, because the heart of Christ is not just being willing to say the truth. It's willing to meet people where they are with an expectation that the harvest is ripe. And if they would in a day where Christianity is more known for what we're for, that our vision for the future where when you meet a Christian, they have more joy, love others more, are more humble, more grateful, more thankful to be alive, more servant-hearted, love their city, serve their city, serve the poor, more than any other worldview where the world steps back and goes, dude, this witchcraft, these books, all these ideologies are doing me nothing. I want what you have. See, God doesn't want us to come to the center of the city, to the neutral place to confront the city. He's sending us to the center of the city, to the neutral place to love the city. Most Gen Z has never read the Bible. If you've never read the Bible, how can we expect them to understand the life-changing message of Jesus? If we're not more bold about what Jesus has done in our life, we got to be at our job and someone says, are you a believer? And we don't even blink. You go, oh, yeah, I follow Jesus. Here's what happened before I knew him, and this is what happened now, and this is where I'm going. And you know what? I would love for you to come to church because there's so much life there. you got to experience this. God's in that place. I know that sounds crazy to you, but God is real. He wants to experience you. Wait, what was that? You can't come? You want to go to the bar for happy hour? All right, I'm going to go experience God. Joy that never fades. Where's that boldness? Where's that swag? So that guy is sitting at his happy hour moment with his, with his Bud Light. <laughs> thinking about you at some prayer meeting. Going, that guy had more joy about experiencing God than I've ever had about anyone throwing a party in my life. Where is that passion where is that zeal? I'm telling you, it's in this room. See, because you don't realize when you throw yourself into something that's over your head, God shows up in power. So many of us want to experience power, but you don't want to take a risk big enough where you need power. 
We want a Christianity where we don't really need God, but we need God. You know what I mean? Like where we got it. We don't want to live a Christianity where if God doesn't come through, we're dead. Don't you think Paul felt like I'm in the center of witchcraft in the whole of the Roman Empire? Do you think he needed God? Yes. And did God show up? Yes. Are you throwing yourself in the deep end to people who really need Jesus? Because here's the irony. Jesus said, I came for the sick. The sick. And I think we look for people who look kind of sick. We judge them. Like, that guy, he's got a clean look, low tattoo, you know, nothing on the neck, face, low piercings. He's smiling. He wants Jesus. Hey, Mr. Suburban. Do you want Jesus? And we're like, what? He didn't want Jesus. Then you go over to the guy who looks crazy, looks mad, is sitting like crazy, F-bombing up a storm, and you go, hey, how's your life? It's horrible. Do you want to change? Yes. You ever met Jesus? No. You want to follow Jesus? Yes. You want to come to my house and have a Bible study? Yes. Because the sick are looking for a solution. Why is it when people are sinning so much, we go, oh, man, they're evil hearts. They are evil. So are you. We're all evil without Christ. But when I see the sin sinning, I go, what are they looking for? They must be really sick to go to a place like that, to do a thing like that, to believe that about themselves. But we avoid the sick. We're looking for the kind of healthy. Can I tell you, we got to run to the sick. That's where Jesus is waiting. We need to run to the sick. We need to run to the angry. We need to run to the disenfranchised. We need to run to the misfits. We need to run to those we'd never expect to come to Jesus because typically those are the people who are looking for Jesus. It's an upside down kingdom. We're laying the plane. This is crazy. Look what happens in Ephesus. A riot breaks out. And what's the riot over? About that time, there was a major disturbance about the way. That's what Christianity was known back then, the way. For a person named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, provided a great deal of business for the craftsmen. When he had assembled them, as well as the workers engaged in this type of business, he said, men, you know that our prosperity is derived from this business. You see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this man Paul has persuaded and misled a considerable number of people by saying that gods made by hands are not gods. Not only do we run a risk that our business may be discredited, but also the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be despised and her magnificent come to the verge of ruin. The very one of all of Asia and the world worship. When they heard this, they were filled with rage and began to cry out, Great is Artemis! And they go, and they sort of riot. Why did they sort of riot? Because so many people had gotten saved that they were afraid their idol business was going out of business. People had been so radically touched by the message of Jesus that the demonic businesses of their day were on the fringe of bankruptcy. If you want to change society, you need to change people. If you want to see a cause changed, you need to change people. There's only one message that changed people. It's Jesus Christ. And when people get changed, society changes. It's happened all throughout. Can I read this quick revival story before we end? Look at this. This is just craziness. This is from a guy named Henry and Richard Blackaby. The results of the Second Great Awakening were extensive and long-lasting. From 1800 to 1830, Presbyterians quadrupled in their membership. Eleven Baptist memberships swelled from 64,000 to half a million. There was also a major increase in the emergence of societies as a result of the awakening. As people were drawn into a love relationship with Christ, they naturally began to care about the same things their Lord did. Numerous societies and homes and foreign missions were spawned. The American Bible Society was established in 1816. Various Sunday school unions were established to teach people the scripture. Organizations such as the YMCA were established. Many of those who can, were converted during the awakening felt called in Christian ministry and subsequently enrolled in seminaries. Princeton Seminary and Yale Divinity School were formed at this time. Music was also affected by the awakening 
bringing many camp meeting songs into the mainstream of church worship services. Significantly, there was also a noticeable alteration in America's moral climate. Crime rates plummeted. Occurrences of drunkenness declined steepedly. Families were restored. God's spirit awakened a nation and brought it back from the precipice of judgment back to him. They go on to say these are the common results when revival touches down and people begin to get changed in a significant ways. Bars and taverns close for a lack of business. This has happened all throughout history in revivals in the scriptures and outside of it. Police and law enforcement personnel see dramatic decreases in crime. There's one revival, the Relsh revival, where the police were bored because there was no crime because everyone had given their life to Jesus. Local sports teams went bankrupt because no one attended the games. They were all in prayer meetings. Businesses received money and merchandise from thieves, employees, and shoplifters returned stolen good. Christians and churches began serious efforts at helping the poor, the needy, and the community through orphanages, ministries to the homeless, and other ministries. Laws changed or were enacted to protect the oppressed and to uphold justice. Reconciliation takes place between races and ethnic groups. Foul language is replaced by civil and wholesome talk. Evil practices such as prostitution ceased and often are outlawed. Private and public acts of immorality decrease dramatically. Marriages are restored and family life is strengthened. If we want to see this for America, we're not going to get it through virtue signaling on social media and virtual signaling from our pulpit. It's going to be finding our team, heading to the neutral place and preaching the gospel to a sick and dying world, world expecting for the gospel to do what it does, save people. And when we don't stop preaching, we don't just preach for an outreach week. We don't just preach for a few months. We don't just preach for a mission school. We preach year after year after year after year after year. All of a sudden, maybe you look up and go, wow, this is a different place. This society has changed. Those laws I was always passionate, everyone's voting for them. That society I was hoping for and was campaigning for, I'm seeing. Because I embraced the inside out, upside down way of the kingdom. Changing people to change society through the gospel. There's a reason why God does this. It's because God himself is missional. He meets us where we are. He does not wait us for us to come to him. God is relational. He wants to spread his message, not just through a microphone. He wants to spread it through a person so that they know that it's not just a message to accept and a movement to join, but it's a family, that he's a father, and that he wants a real and personal relationship with you. He does this because he wants you to know that you're valued. If we want to change society, we need to change us. We need to become influenced by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to end on this next week. So many of you, I want to challenge you to give up control and allow the Holy Spirit, even just for an afternoon or all week with our team, to go and join an outreach in LA. Some of you, your next step is to give up control, to end all your excuses that you're not good at this or you're not good at talking or you don't know what it is and step out of your fear and into the boldness of the gospel to bring love to people who desperately need it. Wouldn't it be amazing that in Easter week, we would see people who would never walk in a church building receive Christ because you made a neutral place for them to experience Jesus in the streets, at coffee shops, on universities, and high schools. I wanna challenge you, this is your moment to step out and to step into the mission that God has for you. Can we just bow our heads for a moment? I'm gonna pray for us, and we're gonna stand and worship. God, you love humanity. You love humanity. You died because you love humanity. Easter week is a massive declaration of your love for humanity, God. 
calling them to repent, to walk away, to change their mind from the things that are killing them and are breaking your heart and to be restored into relationship with you. If tonight you need to give your life to Christ for the first time, or maybe you've been away from God for a long time, but tonight's the night where you know you need to come back and you're coming back to a loving father who's excited to forgive, not an angry parent who's saying, finally, you're back. Maybe you grew up around guilt and shame, but tonight you need to receive grace and be transformed from the inside out. If that's you in this place, I just want you to raise your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. Raise your hand if that's you. I just want to give a moment. I can't see up there. If there's someone up there, please pray. It's just so bright. If there's someone back here in the left, Cirque Riders, maybe just open your eyes. And... Amazing. Thank you for raising your hand. Holy Spirit, I want everyone to pray this with me. Say this. Say, Jesus, I give you my life. I'm ready to leave the old. My old life of selfishness and sin. I want to fully give my life to you. Lead me, Jesus. I surrender to you. I want to follow your ways. I receive your forgiveness. I receive your love. So good. Here's the last thing. Can we all stand together? And I want you to ask if you can just put a hand on the shoulder of the person next to you. If they say no, then just kind of awkwardly stand there, but hopefully they say yes. We want to pray all together as a family for a moment on the count of three. But here's what we're praying. We want to ask the Lord that he would use us to change the culture of Orange County, L.A., and San Diego. Or whatever county I didn't mention that you're from. And we want to ask the Lord tonight for a new download of love for those who are sick and far away from Christ. That God would give us a new boldness and a new passion and a new love to run after those who are farthest from him. I want us to pray this all together on the count of three. Are you ready? Let's all lift our voice. Ready? One, two, three. Let's pray. I want to pray this can we just pray for 30 seconds God show me my team I want you to pray God show me my team who's my team Jesus can you just lift your voice and say Jesus show me my team maybe you already know them maybe you need a team but I want you just to pray say Jesus show me my team who am I to labor with who am I to come together with to change the city you're not meant to change the city alone you need a team Here's the last thing we're going to pray. We want to ask the Lord to give us innovative ideas to create neutral places for people to experience the message of Jesus. Can we all lift our voice together right now and just say, Jesus, give us innovative ideas to reach the lost. God, give us innovative ideas, Jesus, to create neutral places for people to experience you. Jesus, create those places where people feel welcome and their guard is down and they receive a message that they may have never received in the four walls of the church. And lastly, I want to pray for the lost altogether. Can we pray for the broken, the sick of heart, those who are in desperate need for Jesus all across Southern California? They're waiting for an answer. And tonight we're going to pray that Jesus would send an answer through us or through stuck in brokenness cycles of sin jesus we ask lord that you would extend your grace
whether us or someone else. Jesus, we thank you for tonight. We seal this work right now. God, we thank you, Lord, for your missional heart, Jesus. And we say, Jesus, open our eyes and give us a love in our heart that makes us missional just like you. We love you and all God's people said, amen and amen. We're gonna worship for a few minutes, then we'll end tonight. We love you. We wanna be nameless and faceless, all for your fame. We wanna live all for your glory, from the streets to the stage. We wanna be nameless and faceless, all for your fame.
Take us in, Judy.
Get the last slide up. Listen, listen, real quick. The energy, the excitement that we feel in the room was never meant to stay inside the walls. It wasn't meant for Los Angeles. Los Angeles needs this kind of zeal for Jesus. So, listen, real quick, let me get your attention. We're gonna end, we're not gonna do another song. I want you to take the anticipation, the excitement with you to LA next week. So here's the deal. I know for me, when I first started preaching the gospel, it was hard for me to want to go do it alone. But when I got in groups of people that were zealous and on fire for Jesus, it was so much more fun and easy. So next week, you have the opportunity, if you can scan the QR code, it's going to give you all the details for every outreach we have next week, all the times. And you can, you can sign up for one day, for two days, for five days. So sign up, scan the QR code, put in your info. We want to get you connected, get you involved. Come be a part of it with the team. Find other wild, zealous people for Jesus. And let's see Los Angeles flipped upside down with the gospel. So that's the QR code all next week in Los Angeles. Sign up. We'll see you next Monday night, Tapestry LA. We'll see you there.
test You're the only one that I could live for One way, Jesus You're the only one that I could live for One way, Jesus You're the only one that I could live for One way, Jesus You're the only one that I could live for One way, Jesus We hope that you feel encouraged and you can find all these messages at circuitriders.tv. Make a free account today by clicking the link in the description. We'll see you next time.